Hello everyone. Welcome back to Introduction to Semiconductor Devices. In the course so far, we have studied the operation of uh, PN junctions. We also looked at PAN junction and then short key junction. So today, uh, we will expand our uh, horizon a little bit. We will talk about a device which is known as MOS capacitor. A MOS capacitor is a heart is the heart of a modern MOSFET. Okay. So it is still a two terminal device. The actual MOSFET will be four terminal. We will talk about it after we finish with the MOS capacitor. But this two terminal device, which we know as, which is called as a MOS capacitor, gives you the necessary uh, tools to understand the operation of a MOSFET while being simple enough. So uh, what is a MOS capacitor? A MOS capacitor is simply a structure consisting of three parts. Okay, so far we have looked at only P and N or metal and semiconductor, but now we are introducing one more element in between, which is an insulator. So a MOS capacitor consists of a semiconductor. It could be a substrate of wafer. On that, you have a thin layer of oxide, okay, which is an insulator, and then a metal on top. Okay. So that is why the name MOS capacitor, MOS. Okay, just a moment. Uh, MOS stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Okay. And it behaves like a capacitor. That's why it is a cap. Okay, so you're all familiar with the regular capacitors, right? So you have a two terminal device. Let's say I have you know, two metals, Let, let's say metal and metal, two metal plates separated by an insulator, right? This is an insulator. Uh, whose dielectric constant could be some epsilon, right? And you apply a you know, voltage to this. You know, this is, let's say, you apply voltage. You know, let's say this is grounded, and then you apply voltage on that, okay? So we say that this device has a capacitance which is simply going to be epsilon A by D. D is the distance, let's say. This distance, let's say, is D. Then we will say that this capacitor uh, has a capacitance of epsilon a by d. But what does it do? Okay. It is simply a device which will, you know, so let's say if you apply a positive charge q plus q at a certain voltage, let's say we are adding a charge q here, then immediately there will be a minus q charge on the other side. Such basically the capacitance is the relation between c and uh, sorry, capacitance is the relation between q and v, right? You apply a certain voltage. The device has a certain amount of capacitance, so that extent of uh, charge will be on the plate, plus Q on one side, minus Q on the other side. This is a simple capacitor that we have studied before. So now, a MOS capacitor is also similar, but it is one of the plates of a uh, capacitor is a semiconductor instead of a metal. So you have this top plate, which is a metal, right? This is metal. And then you have a separated, you know, insulator. This is SiO2, silicon dioxide, okay, right now, okay, we will change it later, it, it can be an ins any insulator actually, okay, and then the second terminal or second plate is a semiconductor, okay, semiconductor, so this is a mass capacitor, that's why the name, okay. so in this, one of the crucial parameters is the thickness of the oxide, T ox, we call it, thickness of the oxide, and the permittivity oxide, we call it as epsilon oxide, okay? And this is essentially the heart, okay? And to understand this, we will start with uh, several simplifying assumptions, okay? So we will call, uh, we will refer to a capacitor which satisfies these assumptions as an ideal mass capacitor, okay? Of course, you know, no real device is going to be ideal, but for now, to gain the basic understanding, the assumptions that an ideal MOS capacitor has to satisfy are that the metal semiconductor, metal and semiconductor, I should have put here, metal and semiconductor Fermi levels are the same. That means, let's say we have some doping. Substrate can be n-type or a p-type substrate. Let's say it has some doping. The metal also has the same Fermi level. Okay? There is no difference in the Fermi levels. Okay, right now we will make that assumption. Okay, uh, this is at equilibrium. Okay, with no applied voltage. But if you apply voltage, of course the Fermi levels are going to shift as we have seen multiple times. Uh, it's not a very severe uh, assumption. I mean, we can relax it 
quite easily. We will see that in the next week. Okay. And then there are no traps in the semiconductor oxide interface okay, or within the oxide. This is a very, very crucial assumption. It turns out that historically, one of the first transistors or semiconductors to be used was germanium. Okay. And then when they tried to grow an oxide on germanium, the interface was not very good. Okay. By which we mean, let's say you have germanium, let's say if you take, you'll have the germanium lattice, right? Crystal lattice of germanium, which is a perfect crystal, right? That's all. And then you try to grow germanium oxide on top of it. So this is going to be germanium, let's say oxygen, oxygen, and so on. There will be some germaniums which are germanium, oxygen, right? This is an amorphous material. Okay. And when you have this interface between crystal and amorphous, there will be some bonds of germanium. For example, here, let's say this bond is not paired with any germanium or oxygen. It is left dangling. Okay. Or this also could be a bond, you know, which is not satisfied. Basically, we expect that all silicon atoms are connected, right? They have this covalency, or silicon or germanium, similar. Okay, they have they are connected to the neighboring atoms. But now it turns out that if you form this interface between a crystalline and a amorphous material, there are some atoms of germanium which are not connected to any atom of oxygen or germanium. Okay, so these we call it as dangling bonds, just to indicate that they are not connected to any atom. So these are, they behave like a trap and then they actually deteriorate the electrical properties of the device. So it turned out that even though germanium was actually one of the first semiconductors to be investigated, the interface between germanium and germanium oxide was not very good. Whereas the interface between silicon and silicon atom was extremely good. I mean, it has a very, very low defect density. Okay, we will talk about that later. So. We will assume for a moment that ideal mass capacitor has no traps, so no dangling bonds. Okay, so these are basically means no dangling bonds, which is reasonable for silicon silicon dioxide. The number of dangling bonds is quite small, and we will study what happens if they are there later on. Okay, and also in the interface, there is no charge or no trap basically. So it's very common to have some traps within the uh, bulk of the oxide. Now, what do I mean by trap? It could be simply that you know a bond is not satisfied and then there is a positively charged uh, atom there and then some negative charge can come and occupy it or sometimes you know a positive you know, charge could be trapped somewhere it cannot move because of the, uh, the way the crystal is forming. So these are called as you know charge traps and they actually deteriorate the performance a lot. Okay so for now we are assuming that there are no such traps. It's a perfect oxide okay which is a good assumption to make. And then the metal is thick enough to be considered as an equipotential surface. Okay, this is important because, I mean, when we take the regular, you know, macroscopic uh, devices, metals are quite thick. We don't have to worry. But remember, in uh, semiconductor technology, we are always making the devices smaller and smaller and smaller, right? When we make them smaller, let's say if I make this metal 10 nanometers, I make it like this. Do you think that it will behave like a pure metal? Well, of course, no, because uh, metal will have something called a surface scattering. The electrons which are flowing in the metal, there are no more free electrons, but they're scattering with the surface and then the resistivity increases. Okay. Because of which there is some voltage drops as the, you know, if you apply a piece of wood, you know, you calculate the resistivity of metal as you keep decreasing the thickness. At some point when it becomes very thin, the resistivity increases and there is a voltage drop across the metal. And that can lead to a lot of, uh, problems okay so for now we are assuming that you know metal is thick enough to be considered as, as an equipotential surface that means if i apply if I, on this metal let's say if i apply at this point some voltage i'm going to have the same voltage at this point there's no difference between the voltages across there's no voltage drop across the metal surface okay and essentially it means that the i mean there is nothing like a skin depth and things like that for a metal it's thick enough so you don't have to worry okay I mean, it's, it's much bigger than that. That's what we mean. It's much bigger than skin depth. Okay. Anyway, and uh, the other uh, assumption is that semiconductor thickness is much, much larger than the maximum depletion region. We will look at this. And generally, this is a very valid assumption. We don't, you know, this is not a very difficult assumption to satisfy because we are dealing with semiconductor wafers, which are about 500 micron thick. 
okay in the past right now they are about 750 microns thick that means you know 3 fourth of a centimeter uh, 3 fourth of a 750 microns should be 3 fourth a millimeter 3 fourth of a millimeter right so they are quite thick right now so we don't have to worry about that and oxide is a perfect insulator well that is again we already talked about it okay? so it is said that you know the the magic of silicon technology is actually the magic of the interface between silicon and silicon dioxide okay. so silicon dioxide and silicon interface was so great that electronic device operation has been possible and one of the uh, one of the big trends in semiconductors has been what is known as gate oxide scaling okay. why do i want to talk about that well what happened was you know we mentioned we introduced this gate oxide and if you look at the gate oxide thickness in let's say early 1990s it was you know 8 9 nanometers 10 nanometers or so right it's quite high so it was a good insulator and it was a perfect uh, it was a good oxide but because we wanted to make the transistors work faster and faster one of the requirements was that the gate oxide has to become thin. Okay, you have to make it thinner and thinner. Okay. So in a way, we are scaling. We are, I mean, we are multiplying the gate oxide by a certain number, and then we are making it smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is what happened in the semiconductor industry over the last you know, 30 years. Essentially, we start with you know, some thickness of oxide. And then as you come down, the thickness was smaller. This is called 350 nanometer technology, 250 nanometer, 180 nanometer, and by the time we reached 2005 or so, we were at a point, you know, actually 2003, I would say, we were at a point where the thickness of silicon dioxide was 1.2 nanometers. Just imagine, 1.2 nanometers is essentially maybe five to six atomic layers thick. Okay, just five to six atomic layers. It's not microns. You now we mentioned that the, ox uh, the thickness of a human hair is a few microns, micron or so thousand times smaller than that is one nanometer and effectively the capacitor we are building is actually with just 1.2 nanometers of silicon dioxide if i don't know what else you know this is magical right the, the fact that it actually worked is magical but anyway so this is just an image you know this what you know this is what we call as scaling we will discuss scaling later on when i discuss mosfets we will discuss in greater depth what is scaling and how it improves the performance or you know, how it improves the speed of the MOSFET, we'll discuss it later. But for now, I just wanted to introduce, you know, uh, in the context of the MOS capacitor, how does this physically look like? Okay. The images you're seeing on the right side, you know, this is what is called as a TEM image. Okay. This is called as TEM image. Okay. TEM uh, uh, micrograph, we call it. Transmission electron. Transmission electron micrograph so essentially what this is showing you is we take a thin slice of the vertical cross section of a mass capacitor and then shoot electrons at it okay and most of the electrons will pass through but wherever you have an atom they don't pass through so with this technique you can actually see the the way atoms are arranged in a lattice and that is what you're seeing here you see here this is a silicon substrate on the bottom and you can see this order you know i'll zoom it in a little bit so you see this atoms which are arranged these are the bonds which are forming and the atoms are arranged you're actually able to see these atoms the atomic bond lengths will be like you know three to four angstroms and we're able to see that this is really you know magical you know, at least i get fascinated you know I, it's, it's unbelievable that we can do this okay and you see this perfect lattice of silicon on top of it, you see this, this is the oxide, which is an amorphous material. So you don't see that orientation, right? You don't see this perfect lattice arrangement of uh, silicon. You see some random, you know, silicon and oxygen atoms. And the thickness is just 1.2 nanometers. You might wonder, you know, how did we take this image, right? And if you want to take this image, there's an equipment called uh, TEM, which, which is, you know, a few tens of, uh, maybe up to 10 million, 10 million dollars or so. <laughs> you have to... It's a very, very expensive equipment. With that, you can take this image. And then, so you have the silicon substrate and 1.2 nanometer oxide. On top of it, in this case, you know, what is shown is basically 
uh, instead of a metal we are using uh, polysilicon you know so in the origin in the back in 19 you know 70s and 80s we were using aluminum as a metal okay so basically what does our mass capacitor consist of consists of so you have in the metal which is some thickness okay metal in this first okay and then silicon dioxide and then bottom was silicon substrate okay so this would be something like 500 microns thick half a millimeter thick okay whereas this is just you know in the initial days in the early 90s it was 10 nanometers or 8 nanometers but by the time we came to 2003 it was already 1.2 nanometers and this was aluminum in the beginning in the 80s but there were certain reasons why you know we shifted from aluminum to what is known as polysilicon so the idea was that if you take polysilicon we 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 mentioned polysilicon in the first week of the course you know it's not a perfect lattice a perfect long range order of silicon i mean if you have a perfect crystal of silicon there is long range order you travel you know 1 mm across the sample and you still have the same orientation right? it doesn't change but polycrystalline is that you have orientation uh, some lattice structure in the domains but then if you go long distances the domains are randomly arranged that is called as polycrystalline it has multiple crystals so you have this polycrystalline silicon and then if you dope it highly it behaves like a metal it's not a true metal it's a quasi metal i would say but it behave it can work like a metal and there was a reason why semiconductor industry chose polysilicon okay so physically the mass capacitor is consisting of this sort of a structure okay and you see this you know this tox reduce this is tox tox was scaling from you know 10 nanometers to 1.2 nanometers and it turned out that you know uh, this was in 2003 i would say 90 nanometer technology by the time 2005 came there was something called known as 65 nanometer technology where the thickness of silicon became 0.8 nanometers and these are the images taken from a presentation by uh, robert shaw he was a one of the, one of the intel fellows i mean intel fellow is one of the top most uh, technological uh, positions in intel and then he gave a presentation in 2003 i picked it up from there you could search on the internet and you will find it and the picture on the left was taken from another presentation by one uh, gagini he was also an intel uh, fellow so you could look up that okay so uh, essentially it's another direction you have this lattice of crystalline lattice and there is this point 1.8 nanometer thick silicon dioxide and then polysilicon and you see here you see the orientation i mean see this here silicon atoms are arranged in this lines here the silicon atoms are in this direction you have different domains of silicon that's what we mean by polycrystalline silicon okay so uh, when the transistors became such small sizes or you know when the mass capacitors became uh, the th thickness of the oxide became very very small there was pro there were problems there were a lot of problems as such okay one of the biggest problem was oxide is no, no longer an insulator no longer an insulator right when is it an insulator you know okay it has this band gap but the problem is very very thin so electrons used were tunneling above the oxide you know we talked about barriers right and potential barriers and across the potential barrier the electrons can tunnel and give rise to current so if you have a capacitor and you have a leaky oxide you know, oxide became leaky i would say if the oxide is leaking then the transistor action will not work the mass capacitor will not work perfectly okay this was one of the great challenges of the time and this was solved again by intel in 2007 and just when i about i was about to finish my masters you know we we intel announced that uh, there is this uh, in, um, high k metal gate and we'll talk about that later in the, later in the week okay so right now so this is how a actual mass capacitor looks like okay and how did we achieve this silicon dioxide you no know, silicon okay i told you that you know you have this uh, silicon dioxide we take and mix it with carbon and then you can form silicon and then you purify it you know by using a very elaborate series of steps and you get this wafers which are perfectly pure uh, silicon crystals so they have about 9 n purity is what we mentioned so now how do we form silicon dioxide well it turns out that there are two processes to form uh, silicon dioxide one of them is called as dry oxidation 
wherein I simply mix silicon and oxygen, okay, you know, dry oxygen, and then I form silicon dioxide. And this is called as dry oxidation. So basically you pass gas of oxygen and, and on a wafer of silicon, heat it up, and then you form silicon dioxide. There was also another process which is called as wet oxidation, wherein I use water vapor, H2O. If I pass, then I get SiO2 plus 2H2, I think. Yeah. So basically, instead of pass, passing oxygen vapor, you pass water vapor. Okay. And this is called as wet oxidation. If you are to study the where is a technology, they will tell you that this is the process gate oxidation is done by dry oxide, dry oxidation process. Okay. So if you just pass a dry oxygen, just oxygen, no water vapor, then you will get very, very high quality oxide. Whereas if you do wet oxidation, you get low quality oxide, but you can get a very thick oxide. Dry oxidation is a very, very slow process. So you can't make a very thick oxide, but you know, in gate, we just want one nanometer oxide. So dry oxidation is a perfect process for that. And using dry oxidation, we make this oxide on silicon wafer, and then you deposit metal on top of it. That's how you make a mass capacitor. Okay. So this was a brief overview of the structure of mass capacitor. And in the subsequent videos, we will talk about the electrical properties, you know, how, how to understand the electrical properties. And so we'll meet you in the next lecture. Thank you.